Thank you for listening to Scandinavian Crimes Podcast. Be sure to check out the episode links and be part of our other social media platforms where you can leave a topic suggestion or even share some of your insights regarding the subject matter of the episode. We will always do our best to provide a well-researched episode, but sometimes due to limited access to information and translation issues, some information can be lost. It is therefore good to do your own research and get a deeper understanding of a case of your own interest. So with that all said, let us start today's episode. Welcome to another Scandinavian Crimes. My name is Devante and say hello to my lovely co-host Delilah. Hi. And on this podcast, we will cover famous Scandinavian criminals who made their mark throughout Scandinavian history. So today's episode is about two Icelandic men, Gomunder and Garfinnur Innersen. Now, what's interesting is Iceland has notorious and still to this day has had a very low crime rate. So this case blew up very quickly during the time of, you know, the disappearance. This disappearance happened in 1974, an era where there was a lack of technology and knowledge of interrogation techniques. Also, many experts in the field had criticized how this case was handled as well, similar to like, you know, a couple of other cases that we previously mentioned, especially the case regarding uh, regarding Redegard, the the Redegard case with the missing uh, with the girl who was actually killed. So, you know, this is going to be one of those situations where, uh, you know, we're kind of discussing some of the mainstays and a lot of the issues with investigation, especially back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s where, you know, they just thought a confession was a confession and there was no nuance to the game and people took advantage of the lack of knowledge and whatnot. So, um, so it's going to be a very interesting one. So sit back, enjoy, and, uh, let us tell you about the story and disappearance of Gomunder and Garfinner Innerson. On the night of January 26, 1974, Gomunder Anderson, an 18 year old laborer, was walking back home after partying at a community hall in Harfnerfjord. The distance is 10 kilometers away. One driver spotted him walking unsteadily, trying to get another man a hitch on a ride. A short while later, now alone, Gomunder almost fell in front of another vehicle. The motorist drove on, leaving him in the snow, and Gomunder has not been seen since then. It took several days for search teams to start scouring the lava fields, but they were hampered with thick snow, half a meter thick, and after a few weeks, the hunt was eventually called off. Ten months later, on November 19, 1974, Gerfana Anderson, a 32-year-old construction worker, received a phone call while at home and drove a short distance to the Harbor Cafe in Kaflevik. He parked his car a short distance away, leaving the keys in the ignition, and he never returned. Even though Gomunder and Gerfrenner have the same surname, they were unrelated to each other. So just so everyone knows that, they are not related. Extensive searches around the harbor and coast were made to no avail. They could not find anybody. Although the police in Iceland are regularly informed of people who disappear in snowstorms without motive witnesses or even forensic evidence, a murder inquiry was then opened. The Icelandic police were put under intense public media pressure to solve these cases. There were six suspects who signed confessions to murder despite having no memory of committing the crimes. Their lawyers were not allowed much of any contact with them because they were kept in isolation and interviewed under pressure for extended periods of time. Sleep deprivation, water torture, and drugs were allegedly used against them, particularly against Sisevsky, the alleged ringleader. The drugs that were supposed to help him sleep also affected his memory. The suspects said they signed confessions in order to put an end to their solitary confinement. For example, Bordotir was held in solitary confinement for 242 days. Two were kept under solitary confinement for over 600 days, one of whom, Trig V. for 655 days, the longest solitary confinement outside of Guantanamo Bay, United States Military Prison Detention Center. Sieselski was kept in custody for a total of 1,533 days. Other suspects were in innocent solitary confinement for 105 days due to main suspects even mentioning them during the interrogation. There was also Inne Bolesen, Bordotir's half-brother, Magnus Lepolsen, Vladimir Olsen, and Sigljorn Eriksson. Sieselski, Vjorsen, and Levsen were convicted of killing Gormander, while Skafsken 
was convicted of helping hide the body. Sisovsky, Vorsen, and Skefson were later convicted of killing Gerfner. According to the court files, one of the biggest reasons why police seem to latch onto these people is because they seem to have had some sort of interactions or encounters with police previously. Cecilski had a history of drug dealing. He was a crook who had been caught importing cannabis from Denmark. Bordate was Cecilski's girlfriend who recognized a picture of Gomunder. They once met in the school disco several years earlier. Back then, Gomunder seemed to show interest in Bordatir. She also thought that he was a very handsome man, and they had a small chat. She also showed a tendency of remembering the night that they had gone missing. That had been the evening when she had the nightmare in which she heard Cecilski and his friends whispering outside her window. When she told her interrogators about this, they latched onto it. It is assumed the policeman thought it hadn't been a dream, but a potential witness to the aftermath of a murder. This is when the interrogation started to turn very intense and extremely aggressive for both the policemen and the interrogants. After some torture methods, the police had asked her if Cieselski might know something about the second disappearance. She responded, maybe, which they used to further pin on the suspects as a fact. Vidderson was a big man with a reputation as a tough guy. Friends at the time said he was nevertheless a very gentle giant and looked out for his clever but smaller friend, Cieselski. He has had a series of temporary jobs and had the police record of drug offenses and burglary. Levson, a very physical man, was someone to be avoided, especially when drinking, due to his aggressive behavior and tendencies for fighting. He drifted in and out of seasonal work and had served time in jail for petty crimes. Skafson, a gentleman whose only previous contact with the police had been cannabis possession. Most Icelanders came to believe the case had been a bad miscarriage of justice. In 1998, the then Prime Minister of Iceland, Davio Adson, heavily criticized the investigation and prosecution of the case after the Supreme Court of Iceland ruled that it could not rehear the case. In 2018, it was revealed that Adson had given Cieselski financial support and advice to help him get the case reheard. After battling cancer, Levson died in 2009, while Cieselski died after being in an accident in Denmark in 2011. Vyarsson died in March 2021 due to unspecified causes. His family announced his death on Facebook. Some suspect it could have been related to COVID. The case was made public in a BBC radio program in May 2014, which discussed the apparent memory implantation. And for those of you who are not aware what memory implantation truly is, it's more specifically how you can call ORS or pressure someone to recall things that did not happen using very leading information and leading questions. Professor Gisli Gwansson, a former Icelandic detective and internationally renowned expert on suggestibility and false confessions, investigated this cause and stated, quote, I've worked with miscarriages of justice in many different countries. I've testified in several countries, hundreds of cases I've done, big cases. I'd never come across any case where there had been such intense interrogation and such lengthy solitary confinement. I mean, I was absolutely shocked when I saw that. End quote. In 2013, an official police investigator report was handed to the police of the state prosecutor. On February 24, 2017, the Interior Ministry's rehearing committee concluded that the case of Cieselski, Vjarsson, and Levson and Skafinsson would be reheard by the Supreme Court of Iceland. However, the committee did not recommend a retrial for Erla Bordatia's perjury case. On September 27, 2018, the Supreme Court acquitted all five men, but did not reverse Bordatia's conviction. And that is a very terrible story and miscarriage of justice of basically this unsolved murder of Gomunder and Garfinder because it seems like ever since then, the focus has been on freeing and acquitting these men, which unfortunately two or three of them had died uh, by the time we even get to recent years, which is really unfortunate. But, you know, they do, it seems like they deserved it because even if they did commit crimes and they did petty stuff, uh, their records did not show them committing any crimes. And, you know, I'm just going to start off off the rip. This was an extreme, one of the most extreme cases I've ever read including even in college, of how terribly horrible the police did. Not only did they not investigate properly, 
they were just trying to torture confessions out of people, even people who were innocent, who had nothing to do with the trial, who weren't even mentioned in the retrial or even in the uh, arraignment. They were held for months just because their name was mentioned. They could have just been going to the store and then she could have been like, yeah, I saw someone at the store. And then guess what? You were being held. This was horrible. And this is exactly why, like, some things need to be put in place when it comes to laws, because this is absolutely a train wreck regarding the development of this whole situation. Even though this case was not super long, it wasn't super detailed. This was out of control in the highest of orders because they were they're holding records against a military base from the U.S. and the U.S. You already know we're crazy over here. But the fact of the matter is they're still they were doing comparable confinement numbers compared to the U.S. for a murder that they haven't even found the bodies for. And then on top of that, they had no proof and tortured confessions out of them. And like the, these officers, if they're still alive, they need to be prosecuted. This is not like this is not OK, because th this also proves some, some of the numbers that goes on even in the United States, because this used to happen as well. A lot of people especially you know i hate to make it you know one of those situations again but here we are that happens a lot to a lot of people of color you know oftentimes we get arrested very often but we're also 50 percent of exonerated cases which means false arrest this is one of those cases where someone they were falsely accused falsely um charged and convicted and they were innocent because the police officers did not want to do their job it was uh, just, it was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And this is a huge problem. And I hope, and I, like I said, this podcast is for bringing awareness because this should never happen to anyone. But I'm going to stop talking because this stuff gets under my skin. Please, Delilah, just let's transition into something else. Let's go into your opinion. Let's, let's just do that. So before we start with the discussion part, um, I feel like we have to clarify some things. I know there's like a lot of names, a lot of people, a lot of suspects and such. And um, to be honest, it was a lot of like we had to summarize everything. But like we know there's a lot of people involved. And we also saw that there's a lot of things that didn't seem right either. Uh, but it could be because, you know, the cops had a lot of pressure and they wanted to, like, just find anybody who seemed to be anything close to the people. Um, but what we're trying, like, to clarify is that some people who were innocent, um, like, <sighs> basically was also, like, from out of nowhere being judged there was like one person called what was his name scarf and no wait uh i can't say his name it was like super long there was like one guy they had like zero information of uh but because he was like close or something scarpinson uh I can't. Scarpinson. son i can't say his name i think that's how it says his name um they didn't have a lot of information about him. He, it didn't seem like he was even like had anything to do with, you know, the whole friend group who knew each other. Um, but that's that's at least the information that we had. But he still got, you know, judged and sentenced. It also, you know, wrote that he actually was part of it, um, of the murder. So... Um, I guess before you go into your point, just to clarify, you know, nice, concise point. <laughs> um, what she's saying is basically that the police um, definitely arrested more people than was initially believed to be involved. And tortured a lot more and people, And they definitely too. interrogated and technically tortured a lot more people to get the answers that they were looking for. And obviously, as you've heard in the story, there was a retrial for several of them because of that so the police did not quite do their jobs this time around unfortunately they were just looking for anything to stick and just solve it because they were under some pressure and unfortunately it seems like you know a lot of a few innocent people if not all of them i don't know obviously the details of that yet um but 
they seem to be, you know, innocent. And unfortunately, the police did very scrupulous things to get those convictions. So uh, that's basically what she's saying. So just just to clarify, we're going to talk more about, you know, the torture thing. But before we start with that, I just want to do a short like comparison between the Red and Gord case, if you guys remember it a couple of weeks ago. Um, where they did like they didn't do the torture thing, but they did do this like interrogation where they try to like you know get the information they wanted and had like leading questions like how they interrogated was like you know wrong. Um, and they were kids too, so that's also a thing that you know wasn't as good. And they also got criti- like crit- criticized for it. Um, and but like in this case, the torture tactics of like drug they drugged them, they isolated them, mm-hmm. uh, and like in they I really like isolated them like they were prisoners. Yeah, well, I they think didn't for have days any, at a time. I think. Yeah, they, they didn't even have any lawyers. The same thing as the Red and Gold one. They didn't know any their rights at all, um, and just the way this case was handled was not only. That the police didn't do really a good job to like understanding who the culprit was they basically just used that one thing that Bala daughter said like that one thing she was like I had a dream they're like proof guilty and just used that as a tool to basically find whoever was sitting in her dream or her- like it was so and she also was drugged out. She was probably tired as hell. Like, there, it's just like, this whole case is really disheartening. I'm glad they got a retrial, but that was like years later. And also, all, most of them were, I think most of them were, uh, have like, they, I think they soon, like, most of them soon died after the retrial. Yeah, about two or three of them actually died. So they died so they basically, in prison. Like, and <sighs> yeah. What I guess what's frustrating is like uh, one thing I've noticed too. This is not even just one country. This is globally. I think a lot of people when the police force was, I mean, I don't want to get into that part. But they basically, have when pressure the police force, on them to they do have pressure, things, or like, when they were very like, ignorant of actual investigative tactics, their go-to was the torture. And for for those of you who, you know, out there who don't know, torture actually is the most unreliable form of confession. And that's because anybody will say anything if you cause them enough pain because they just want the pain to stop. If you starve them, they'll say anything because they're hungry. They're delusional. You deprive them of water. Your body's going to start to shut down and you will say anything. Yeah, that's it's right. a survival yeah. instinct. Mm. Your body will say and do anything just to keep itself alive. So and they were like, yep, we did our job. Let's yeah, do this. And they like, would think that's okay. And I'm like, no. It's yeah. literally one of the most highest forms of unreliability in terms of any form of interrogation. But unfortunately, people like to do it. They think that's how you get results. And, you know, no matter how innocent you are, you, if you get tortured enough, trust me, you will do things. You will say things you, I promise you, you thought you would never do. Because the pain or how they do it can be so excruciating, so uncomfortable and so intense. And that's unfortunately that should have never be allowed. It's a very barbaric form of interrogation. Instead of actually investigating, it's very lazy, actually, because, you know, people were able to investigate for centuries. But unfortunately, small minded people don't want to do that. They just want to get someone to confess. And that's it. So, um, yes, I'm insulting people who are lazy to do their jobs. So, um, but that's that's one thing that bothers me specifically, just how barbaric. The thing that I also hate about this case is the solitary confinement thing. I, I, I like it to me. It just feel like they just they, they basically treated them as they were criminals. M- maybe because they had records, but like the only one who had a major record was the uh, Selsky, and uh, he. I think it was only he for was like, like cars he was a drug dealer like yeah, and, like, like, and drugs and exactly. stuff like that. It wasn't the even other like ones violent crimes. Seemed to be like yeah, exactly. The other ones seemed to like have possession of drugs, but they were pretty much chill people. It mm-hmm. seemed like it, from the witnesses who knew them. And um 
they basically were treated because they had some records as criminals and they were put in solitary confinement, which has also been proven that it gives memory loss and also hallucinations and imaginational, Mm -hmm. you know, stuff to it. So I think one of them had like the longest solitary confinement in the world, more than the the second one, which was in the States, right? And like how long they've been been confined. Yeah. Um, and and also once again for the audience, if you don't know about con- solitary confinement, interesting like I said, humans were very interesting as a species. We're very social creatures. No matter how antisocial you think you are, how how socially awkward you may be, you have to interact with someone in some way, shape, or form. Your mind literally will start to unravel when you don't have any form of contact or communication. Mm. So that's why, especially in the US Solitary confinement is its not necessarily a death sentence, but if you're perfectly sane, you will go crazy in solitary you can confinement. You go crazy. When you come I think out, it, it even have a couple almost. of days mm-hmm. because you you lose track of time. Mm-hmm. You, especially if you have like white walls and stuff, like if you have like only one color, like only darkness, it yeah. could be that as well. A, sh- a small room, you can actually develop like a really like a. P- a lot of things after you're freed from it but mm-hmm. i think there is a li- they, I, I hope they everyone in it, most countries have like a limit of how long they can confine somebody but because i don't think like it, it actually gives severe like mental <laughs> like uh problems if they like confine them for too long but this was like back in what 80s 90s they might have not known how much damage damage this could do and what it could have done uh, let me just see the this year. was 1974 so yeah okay so it was in the 70s yeah maybe they didn't really know any better well it's it's hard to say honestly because solitary confinement wasn't a new concept people knew what happened even back in the 16, 17, and 1800s. It's just people, unfortunately, like I said, lazy who just didn't want to realize or didn't care to realize what it can do to them until it happened to them or something like that. Because, like, I guarantee you, there's plenty of cases in history where, you know, people thought one thing and then the second they got caught up in something, they realized how harsh it was. Um, but this is, remember, all this stuff is not new. It's just recently in modern history. You know, it's we have now undeniable evidence like this stuff affects people on a mental on a mental Mm -hmm. level and it's hurting them far more than it is helping them or even punishing them because, you know, like I said, you're developing forms of psychosis or mental issues that can permanently, you know, affect your quality of life. So it sucks. But like I said that's just people being lazy and they don't want to do their jobs and they just mm. find the quick you know painful way of doing something to get what they want I also want to like before we ended for today I guess I just wanted to talk about the Bolater uh, the one who they basically took every evidence of and used to use it as fact And even though, like, she was basically a snitch, um, she wasn't really doing it on purpose. She was just trying to be honest with... she Because she was the one who, like, you know, basically said, I had a dream. Like, she basically tried to give as much information as... She's just trying to be, like, someone who gives a lot of information, which is, like, actually helping the police, but they use it against her. And um, what I hate about it is that she was drugged out, isolated, you know, here, the memory loss thing, not like understanding, like, you know, maybe even imagining that that dream ever happened because she was like, maybe, you know, I know the other guy who died. Like, I don't know. Like, she was like, she didn't really give any clear answers. And I feel bad for her because everyone else got a retrial except her. And I think it's because she probably was the one who initiated or like did t- told lies, even though she couldn't really help it because we don't know her how her mental state was at that time because she was tortured. 
Um, you know what? So I just feel like she should have also received a retrial, but I'm, they maybe they seemed it was justified because she was the one lying, basically. Uh, but like you said, she didn't lie intentionally. And like I said, what's really dumb, honestly, it's the harsh, reason why yeah. this discussion in general is not going to be as long or lengthy as the other ones is everything comes down to, once again, just poor decision making by the police. Just them not doing their job, them not investigating properly. You never take someone. Yeah, you you never take someone at their word. If someone comes in the police station and says, I had a dream that someone did such and such, is it a possibility that they could be remembering something? Sure. But also, your job is to investigate it. You have to look into it before you just outright, oh, wait, this must be the truth. And then when things don't turn out the way that you expected them to, oh, now, now they must be lying. I'm like, that's not quite how it works, especially when you're torturing people, drugging them out. And what makes this even crazier of a story is that the police were drugging out the witnesses, people who never even made it to court. They were drugging witnesses. They were torturing witnesses. Mm-hmm. So it's like they were doing this to any and everybody, just, just assuming an someone would give them a confession. And I'm like, that is severely un- unethical, like and the on, crazy a, on the part highest is level. about all this is that they all already know that people go missing over there because you know snowstorms, the cold. Like, right. They even try to find the body, and people was like, "This is not normal." Usually, we find people who are going missing because if they died during the weather. But sometimes this, like what I heard or seen, is that sometimes the like the snow can really bury, like or like, you know. Whatever yeah, they were saying like is like it's, it's gonna be hard like to retrieve the body, basically what they said, um, or what I've been reading, and but because people felt like this could be a murder, you guys have to do your job, and then they got like a lot of pressure on the they put a lot of pressure on the police, but it's it was not uncommon for people to disappear. To be honest with you, the first the Gulmunder case one. Um, honestly, he could have just been one of those who went missing due to the cold or like because he he didn't he seemed to be, um, you know, intoxicated because he was coming from a party and such. Right. And. Uh, but the other one who who like to me, the actually Gerfundro case one, um, it seemed to actually uh, you know, to me, it seemed to be uh, a case of him actually dying or being murdered or something because the car key and everything was there. So that's why I think Gerfner case seemed to be like a murder more than the Gummunder case because it was like fishy that he got a call, he drove all the way to the cafe thing had the car in ignition and never returned. That seems like it could be like a criminal organization thing, but I don't really know if they had that back in the day in Iceland. But like that to me seemed to be more like, you know, something that is a little bit fishy about that. Um, But either way, I don't think the other ones who deserve to get what they reserved deserved. Um, so I'm glad they got a retrial. And uh, even though it's like way too late for that, but, you know, a lot of people nowadays, they actually start being freed for crimes they never committed back in whatever time they were judged and sentenced. And I'm glad that, you know, some people get justice, but it's so unfortunate to see Especially if that's like they they got sentenced as a young, like person, adult. Um, it, it's very disheartening, and um, even though they got their justice, they've been innocently put in jail for something, for poor, basically poor way of, you know, of the police to handle a situation. Um, that's why I don't like. Like, I don't like cases where 
and there's a lot of media exposure or a lot of media pressure because I feel like usually like politics like political people and I was like a many like a lot of people get involved in something that will pressure the investigators and you know people all they all everyone just want to look good in front of the you know media sometimes it's good for pressure and for media exposure exposure and pressure but it's not always you know good because sometimes this can happen that the police or investigators don't do a great job in handling the case properly um, and sometimes it's good to pressure them because sometimes they don't do it at all yeah, and media exposure is good so it's like yeah it's a pro and con to everything I guess so yeah after all that guys let me know what you think in the comments of either the podcast or our social media platforms you already know how you can reach out to us we are having a few of you reach out to us already so that's lovely to hear and it's nice to see you guys actually reaching out and communicating with us and all that stuff but continue to do so and remember our information is limited because you know when you're in different countries and stuff like that unfortunately um we can't see too much information or the same information that maybe some of you are seeing so if you see something that maybe is different or maybe you have more information or something that's slightly more correct than the information that we have send it to us we actually want that stuff to be sent to us so that way not only can we give you a shout out but we can actually correct ourselves so um i hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful day. I hope, uh, well, night, day, whatever time of day it is for you. I hope uh, your family stays happy and healthy and safe. And uh, we will see you in the next one. <laughs> Peace out. Wait, we forgot to talk about the food thing. I don't appreciate that because I do like and look forward to it. So I'm going to say what I like and what I've eaten. I ate yesterday like I ate something that was really good. It was Asian sauce thing with shrimp. Either way, <laughs> Devante is distracting me. Um, I think that was some really good rice and that shrimp uh, sauce thing is heaven. I'm going to eat actually the rest of it today. So I look forward to something. So that's what I wanted to say before I say bye. Peace out. See you guys next time. Ciao.